Good morning, Softball America. Welcome to the show. We got our mugs. It's noon where I am. It's 10 a.m. where Tara is. But it's always time for coffee. Glad that you're here. Gray Robertson, Tara Henry. It's been a minute. Non-conference is madness oftentimes, not just on the field, but for us covering it in our variety of capacities. Tara, how are you? I'm great. I'm just happy to be back here doing this with you partner i it's been a it's been a minute and gosh there's so much for us to cover and can't thank our listeners and our subscribers enough for for joining us uh for a little bit more softball talk uh every day i love it i just it just gets better and better uh we're talking softball every day oh yeah and we've got so many more shows coming up by the way softball speakeasy returns tonight you've got Sydney spin on Thursday. The final swing we are hoping is on Friday. We've had as many technical issues as you can imagine uh, putting that together. And then also Walton's World coming back on Thursday. I don't know, Tara, uh, th like Tim Walton is just crushing it on the guest front. And this week is as good as it gets. Well, I when I had this conversation with Tim in Dublin and for it to come to fruition now, uh, it's been just incredible to see who he's been able to get on the show. And I can't wait for the Mike Candrea interview. I had to miss that one this week. And let me tell you, I've got notifications set. So hopefully you all will enjoy that. Uh, Walton's world. Just excited to have him on and be a part of our Softball America network. And it's just been a really fun start to the season. Uh, I can't believe we're we're almost a month in. It's absurd to me. And by the way, a quick little Mike Candrea story before we truly start the show. So he was in Tuscaloosa this weekend. Kaylee Tao and I were calling uh, the Crimson Classic games on SEC Network Plus. Tao and I are in the in the booth, and Kenzie Fowler has told us that Mike Candrea is coming, and we see him. And I say, Tao, we gotta go. We gotta go. We gotta go talk to him. We have to go meet this man. And so he's talking to Coach Murphy and a couple of the Alabama coaches. That conversation ends. He's walking by. And Kaylee Tao and I stop him and I say, coach, it's nice to meet you. I'm Gray Robertson. It's an honor to get to see you and to have you here. And he said, oh, it's an honor to meet you too. I looked at him. I said, I mean, not really, but thank you for saying something so nice. And he was just such a, such a gentleman when we were chatting about the sport and about Arizona. And I congratulated him on what was at the time, his last day as interim athletic director at Arizona and I just, uh, it's a great conversation. Check it out. That'll be airing tomorrow at, I believe, noon Eastern time, 11 a.m. Central is when it's scheduled, the next episode of Walton's World. Yes, 9 a.m. Pacific. So don't forget the West Coast here, Gray. 9 a.m. Pacific <laughs> for those on the West Coast. But again, Coach Candrea spent years, obviously, playing against him. And I just know anybody and everybody that's a part of that Arizona softball program has looked up to him and it was always just an honor to play those teams because they're always tough they're always gritty and a huge part of our sport in laying the foundations uh for excellence at arizona so excited for you all uh to get a little chance at, at the at tim walton and mike candrea uh conversation we also have a special guest joining us later on in this episode tara do, do you want to make the announcement well, I think we'll wait till our special okay. guest uh, gets on to the show, but big announcement, and we've got a former great uh, that is going to be jumping back into the game, and I can't wait for you all to meet this said person, and, <laughs> and so we'll wait till she jumps on uh, for our big announcement, but we'll give you a hand. It, it, it involves uh, some pro softball. 
And also another hint, we know it's a she. Ha <laughs> ha. A little slip there, Tara. So detectives online, go and check. By the way, speaking of detectives online, we know you love to comment and the chat is open. So if you want to pop in and say hello, ask some questions, please do so. We have heard from our friend Feng Nai. Good morning to Tara and Gray. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining our space last night for the Top 25 Chatter, which was just a huge hit. I was like, whoa, there are so many people here and I'm I'm going to be late for dinner. And <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun to, to chat about the poll. And I guess, Tara, that's where we can start with the show. The battle for number one, Oklahoma and Texas. Oklahoma falls for the first time in many, many games, many, many days. The 71-game win streak has come to an end. And it was in as weird a fashion as you could craft, I think. I'm not necessarily shocked that it was Louisiana. I'm a little shocked it was this Louisiana team. But I'm most shocked, period, that the game was kind of gross all the way around. I mean, it was a good softball game, but nobody really played well. Louisiana just made fewer mistakes in the end. Absolutely great. And, you know, I went back to take a look at the game. I actually rewatched it. And it was interesting because at the beginning of the game, I saw the lineup and I saw Coleman in the nine spot. And I messaged uh, Plank, actually. I said, hey, Plank, when's the last time Coleman's actually been in the nine spot? How This is an interesting lineup for the Sooners. And Coleman has been in the nine spot. Let's, it's six times in 2022 and one time uh, in 2021 against Mizzou. But if you take a look at the uncharacteristic errors that Oklahoma had, uh, I think you would argue that it was a sloppy game uh, for the Sooners of a 5-7 loss in extra innings but you got to tip your cap to Jerry Glasgow. Uh we there's a reason we always put Louisiana in the top 25 in the preseason because that man simply knows how to coach and bring a team together and get those gritty gritty wins. And when we get into the RPI and start talking about Louisiana, I, I think there's a, there's a formula to that success and yes, they had to go through the gauntlet uh in Louisiana's pre-conference play but as they head into conference uh that's going to pay uh dividends and again i i'm excited to see how oklahoma responds to that loss and uh shake it shook up the the softball world a little bit because polls were split and now texas is uh the number one in two polls and oklahoma is the number one in the other two polls i i am very excited to talk about poll math you know i love the math but one of the things that struck me the most about Louisiana was the way that they were able to make Oklahoma uncomfortable. And I was texting Kaylee Tao during the game, and there was that moment where they did the double steal. And we were like, oh, this is a Jerry Glasgow special. Okay, he's he's just pulling out all the stops and doing everything he can to try and make the Sooners uneasy. And that's very hard to do. It's very hard to for lack of a better term, rattle a team as good as Oklahoma. And it felt like at times they were rattled. You know, Gray, I, I couldn't agree more. And you got to think about the pressure that that squad has felt, not only this year, but stepping onto the field at Loves and Miami, Ohio, you'd argue, uh, was right there and could have could have been the team to upset OU as well. But I think there's an immense amount of pressure uh, on Oklahoma being in this new stadium, but also a team that we're going to see how they respond to this because we're not used to seeing an Oklahoma defense that, per se, for one uh, thing or another, unraveled. Uh, I, I haven't seen uh, an Oklahoma defense unravel in that aspect, but uh, that is that was that was part of it. And like you said, I think putting pressure on the defense and not getting a few key plays and it and unraveling. No one could stop the bleeding. And normally that is what Oklahoma defense the, is really good at, is stopping the bleeding. And that did not happen uh, in that Louisiana series. Yeah, and I go back to one of my favorite Nick Saban quotes, which is never waste a failure. And so I, I'm curious to see how Oklahoma tries to utilize this loss, tries to utilize the mistakes that they made as a launching point going forward last year we saw them do that in a way that no team has ever done before in college softball so I think that that is something to watch especially this week when you've got 
four games that if I'm being very frank, Oklahoma should win comfortably. And I'm curious to see what the mindset looks like and what the intangibles look like uh, on the field in the four games this week against A&M Commerce and then the three game series against Iowa State. And again, we'll see how the Sooners respond. But I also want to get into uh, the Texas Longhorns. And I don't know if we've we've got that on the docket here before we have our special guest uh, actually join us. But you know, I think when you're taking a look at number one, the number one team in the nation, um, you know, you could argue that they are headed head. They were one vote away on the one point. Point. One point. One point. That's as close as you can get. Even though Oklahoma had more first place votes, Texas ahead in the ESPN poll by a single point. And people have been asking me, Gray, do you know the the list of people that actually vote on that ESPN USA uh, softball poll? I do not. Do you? No, I know a few people that actually vote on it, but I don't have the entire list. But it would be interesting uh, to see who actually votes in that. Yeah, I I know the poll I vote on. (laughs) And we have a coach's poll list. And we, I mean, I think ESPN is the only poll where we don't have a full list, but that's honestly neither here nor there. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we could figure that out. I don't know. Maybe the fans know you guys can help us out. I, I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. I'll figure it out. Pop in the chat and <laughs> reveal people's personal lives. Let's do this. <laughs> Detectives. Uh, I love it. <laughs> but all right. So let's go to Texas. So, we had the conversation with top 25 chatter space, which again, thank you everybody for tuning in, uh, in that battle for one and two. It's an interesting discussion at the end of the day. It is kind of a moot point because they're going to play fairly soon, but Texas has done pretty much everything right this year. And, and, you know, their one loss has been an extra to Nija. I mean, I, I'm not going to give anyone major flack for losing to Nigeria Kennedy, let alone doing so in extras that were tied in regulation. Um, I, I think that Texas and OU, it's just, it, it's all coming to that point. It, it feels like it's all coming to that point when they meet up in the next few weeks. I agree, Gray. And I think my argument on the space, which I apologize for those that did uh, join us on the space, Brady and I had some some technological issues. And so the space wasn't actually recorded. So I apologize. But what I said on the space is I truly believe that Oklahoma is still the number one team in the country, unless they lose again until those two play head to head. And I think Texas needs to come out with the series win in order for me personally to put Texas in that number one spot. I think when you have a team that's won that many games in a row, what, 71 games in a row for them to drop one game and then to drop out of that number one spot. I just find it really hard uh, to argue that. Now, when you look at uh, the metrics, when you take a look at statistics, yes, on paper, Texas does look like a better squad. But until, in in my personal opinion and my voting, until Texas is able to beat Oklahoma, uh, I, I'm still having Oklahoma in my number one spot on my voting poll. I kept Oklahoma number one because I still think they're the best team in the country right now. Uh, Even though I just said Texas is doing everything right. That's a testament to how often Oklahoma is doing everything, not just right, but spectacularly this year. And one of the other factors that went into it for me was the strength of schedule metric Uh, going into Sunday night and going into Monday morning, Oklahoma did have the advantage. Now, Amazingly, in this world of parody, Texas playing Penn State on Monday actually gave them the advantage. So, like I said on the space, I wonder if we had waited a day, how that would have shifted the conversation. Maybe I would have picked Texas. I don't know. Uh, but I, I just, Oklahoma, the, the loss to Louisiana came out of nowhere. And I even said watching the Miami of Ohio game and watching how that unfolded, you know, that this to me is nothing more than a headline. It doesn't change how I view Oklahoma. Um, One loss does not change my perception of what the season will look like. I still think they're very good, and I still think they're the prohibitive favorites to win the national championship. If there are a couple more losses, if there are a couple more, you know, 
sleepy games for lack of a better phrase, then we can have that conversation. But uh, nothing was going to, I think, create a major shift for me personally, kind of no matter how that single game played out. I agree with you, Gray. But when you take a look at Texas and that pitching staff with Tegan Kavan and, and her ability to do what she's done as a rookie in her rookie season, uh, and then Sitlali Gutierrez, which arguably uh, in the preseason, we had, had ranked Mac Morgan uh, as the ace. And when we had spoken to both Mike White and Steve Singleton, we're like, hey, you got to you know keep an eye on Tegan Kavan and, and Sitlali. So and then we're not even talking about Sophia Simpson or Estelle check. It's, it's incredible the depth that Texas has. And if anybody is going to combat the sooner offense, it is a team like Texas. So I think we've all got our eyes on that matchup as we head on down the road. Uh, but I think that's enough about Texas and OU. I mean, we've got a good, um, good amount of time on it, Gray, unless you've got anything else to add. I'll just add one thing. Sitlali Gutierrez, major surprise. I did not expect her to be throwing the critical innings that she is throwing and pitching so well in those critical innings, especially after watching and tracking her last year. So uh, that's that's all I have about that. We've got more to talk about. Surprise teams, the first RPI, where in the world is Tara Henry, which I often ask myself. Uh, that is back on the show. But I think, Tara, it's time for you to, to tease our, our special guest. Yes, so we have our special guest of the week, and I'm so excited for our our guest, uh, Leah O'Brien Amico, three time gold medalist, and we're bringing her on because we've got a big announcement, and I can't wait to have her her join us. Leah, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So for those of you that are on here, uh, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. But big announcement, uh, we've got Coach Amico. She's going to be taking on the head coaching duties for the Florida Vibe. And big announcement. I think that's just breaking news here uh, on the Softball America podcast. Uh, Leah, tell me uh, how this all came about uh, as the new head coach of the Florida Vibe. Yeah, actually, it's a big announcement to me as well, in the sense of this really was not a plan as of a month ago. I would have been like, what? There's no way. And, you know, it's just funny the way things happen. I have been working the last three years with Team Israel, the under 18 and under 22. So each summer we've had different um, experiences and, and different tournaments. But this year we don't have anything. We have one little, you know, we have a Canada Cup and then not anything until August. So when Ryan Moore ended up calling me up. I thought, you know what? You need to listen. Even if I think I said literally in my head, 99% chance it's a no, but I need to hear him out. <laughs> so as he started explaining the Florida, Florida vibe and their plans and what he's been building the last couple of years and how, you know, this, his idea of pro softball and how this can work. I know there's been a lot of different breakoffs and variations and organizations, right? In our sport and at every level, really. Um, I really, loved what he had to say. I feel like the way he does things, it sounds like it's heading in a very positive direction. And Tara, I know, and, and Gray, like that, anything for our sport that potentially can lift up these athletes and give them more opportunities. I mean, I think that's a, a positive and a bonus. And so um, I'm excited to walk into this new territory. Coach Amico, first off, hello. Nice to meet you. I feel like we're probably going to get to know each other quite well because I've been involved with the FGCL from the beginning. So I've seen the vibe and Team Florida initially become the vibe and how all that has grown. I I'm curious. I've heard the pitches from Ryan. I've heard the conversations about the plans. You said you liked what he had to say. So I'll ask you, what what did he have to say? What is the vision for the vibe, for the pro league, for, for what – all of this will look like moving forward? Well, I think it needs to be a win-win for everybody. I think in our sport, we hear a lot of people saying support women's sports, which we want more fans in the seats. It's really hard when you have young kids playing every single weekend and practicing how many times a week. So it's hard because where does, where is there even extra time? And, you know, I actually coached one year um, with the, the Florida pride. And so, you know, you see, 
obviously for them it worked because the organization was able to help support and sponsor and pay for a lot of those you know those players to be able to be paid to play but not everybody has that that depth and that income and so a lot of these companies that come in right they're excited about female sports they're wanting to support and then they lose a bunch of money and they're like okay how long can i sustain that is that reality and is that realistic and so therefore they don't stay in it they pull out their money and then they try to find another owner and in my mind the way ryan's doing it by building that college league which essentially in my opinion is the old days it's women's ball we we all traveled all over found ways to pay <laughs> to try to go play against these women and you know and we were in college still but wanting to compete at the highest level those of us that you know i mean there were some women who again on the usa team anybody on the usa team they were playing women's major i mean years and years and years after college ball so obviously this college league is that idea i think that can grow i love the idea of the college league as well like you mentioned gray you being a part of it i'd heard a little bit about it but what i i think i love is these teams have so many players on the rosters that there are so many players that go and yes you practice all year and you're a part of the team but let's be real by the time i mean when i played and and tara i don't know how many people were on the team when you played but you know we had 13 14 players on our roster <laughs> and so you know like you got that time but now you're doubling that and i just think for me like people that can get at bats against other college pitchers but i think the fact that it meshes and and it actually blends together one can feed the other the supports there i think these athletes that are in this you know in the college leagues can eventually be like that's i'm going to be on you know the vibe next and and just look forward to that so those are just my i, I haven't delved enough into it i'm gonna know a lot more after this summer but just as a first look from what i've heard that's my thoughts and leah you've been on a part of so many incredible teams uh and have witnessed excellence and know the standard that you need to play at in order to win at the highest level what are you most excited about heading into this venture as a coach as you put together this team you know, I don't know a lot of these players personally. I'm sure that I've, you know, maybe called some of their games. I do only a little bit. I do, you know, the Women's College World Series with um, Westwood One. I get to announce with them each year. But I think to get to see them as individual athletes, that was always my my favorite is that we were able to find out what are our individual strengths, the personalities on the team, and then how can that just be this positive, encouraging, you know, battle tested environment that now we can go out and we can try to shine on the field. What are the lessons we learn when it doesn't go well? How do people res respond to failure? And, you know, I mean, even even with Team Israel and I've done it, you know, and it's there's obviously different levels and different things, but it's like, what is the win for this team? What is our best? with these athletes. And, you know, a couple of years ago, actually, I took a team and to the Maccabi um, Olympics or well, it's it's the Jewish Olympics in um, in Tel Aviv area. And we ended up winning the gold medal against, um, you know, the America Israeli Maccabi team. And and I remember watching these athletes and, you know, I had a former um, Oh gosh, she was going to kill me because I think it was Virginia. Oh, might have been Virginia, Virginia Tech. Liv Gott was our catcher. She was awesome. She was, you know, a former player. Um, and so she like was behind the plate and her and I were calling pitches together. And it was so fun to be able to like join her strength but to then give my input and to see like the mix of that. And we went on to win the gold. And honestly, I'm going to tell you, I've celebrated on a lot of fields. It was so neat to stand back and just watch them. It was the coolest thing. I'm like, okay, this is the other side. And now I can like, just think about what coach Candrea felt when he watched us after helping us get to that podium. So what does the personnel look like for this team? What's the coaching staff look like? How, how, early are the planning stages for putting together this roster and this staff how are things going for you in that regard well it's in the very very early stages there was this was all being confirmed and like truly that final yes like as of a, a few days ago so that will be the next step for me that will be the next step will be to meet the players, start connecting, start getting to know some of these athletes and just start to build that relationship because I really believe that 
I think everything in life in order to be successful, it's all about our relationships that we have as well, because that's how you get to know people. And so I'm excited for that part too. That's always as an athlete, that was always such an important part of who I was. Um, on my teams. Like I cared so much about my teammates. I really wanted to get to know each of them. We were all so different, you know, and some you naturally are, are more pulled towards, but I loved even the ones that like, just, again, we were so different. Like I loved the conversations and learning from them. So I know it's going to be the same, even though it's a different role. Um, I've coached high school ball. I've coached, um, you know, that the pride one season I've coached, um, Israel, the last couple of years, I, each summer I take a team of high school players for about 10 years overseas to play. And it's only like a week long, but it's a week of like, how do we, how do we gel like within one week, you know? And so I think I love the challenge of that, but ultimately building those relationships. And you spoke about K coach Candrea and you were obviously able to play uh, for the Arizona Wildcats. What do you think is the greatest lesson that you learned uh, playing for, for Coach Candrea as you look back uh, on your career there? I learned that you set the example for the expectations you want everyone else to rise to. You, you lead. You lead by example. And, and you care about the people you're leading. And when you do that, they're going to give you their best and great things can happen. I wanted to make sure that we touched on what this league, this professional landscape will look like in its entirety. You've got the New York Rise, the Oklahoma City Spark, the Chattanooga Steam, the Florida Vibe, all coalescing into this new organization. How excited are you to, to get to go to all those places, to get to face all those teams, and to get to kind of be a part of this, this new league landscape? Again, like you said earlier, we've tried this a lot in this sport over the years. <laughs> but hopefully this is one that can stick. Yeah, I like the idea. I know the Spark now, you know, are, are going to be playing. And I think that's great for the sport, obviously, all those players in just Oklahoma right now, the Mecca of softball that it is. Um, I think it's great. And I, I'm excited to see that it already seems like it is going in the right direction with the Spark saying, hey, okay, maybe I want to go this direction because I believe, again, there's that support for female sports and they're trying to find what is the best avenue to then be able to allow this to grow. So I, I'm excited. And I, and I think, again, you have them in, in some different regions and um, I think it's good. I think it's set up in a way that you'll go in and you'll play, you know, that series in one area. Um, and then I, that idea of at the end as well, coming together for the championship. I think that's important as well to be able to have truly a championship and then hopefully after this year, there'll be more teams and then you get more of that competition. I know generally it is between that four, maybe six teams that we've dealt with with pro softball in all the different ways. Um, but I don't know. I'm just excited the direction this is heading. And I think the places that it, you know, it's located right now is, is a good start. Well, Coach Leah, O'Brien, Amico, I can't not say O'Brien. Um, <laughs> Coach Leah, Amico, uh, where can people find out if they would like to, number one, be a part of the vibe or have any uh, questions uh, regarding what's happening this summer? Yeah, it's Florida Vibe. I think it's FloridaVibe.com, <laughs> but let me make sure because I know that Ryan sent it to me. Um it's, oh, I said it wrong. I'm glad that you asked that. And I looked it up. It's vibesoftball.com. So go to vibesoftball.com and you'll be able to check everything out, the team, and you'll get to see, you know, the history of it. And, and you're able to connect with them and ask any questions. And I actually recently had an athlete who didn't even know I was going to, I was even in talks with them. And she was looking to try out for one of these you know, these pro teams. And, and so she was like, where do I go? And I was like, oh, and I just directed her. There you go. Just re reach out to them. <laughs> so yes, vibe softball. <laughs> well, coach, it, it's exciting to have you on the show. We're excited about this announcement. I know I'm starting my summer in Florida and then I'll be up in Chattanooga. So I will be seeing you a good bit awesome. this summer. And uh, we're excited to watch this league get going and, and hopefully continue to grow after this year. Thanks for hopping on with us. Yeah, thanks so much for um, covering all of it, you guys. I, I think it's so important, right, to be able to continue to um, put it out there for everybody to hear so that they know. I know for me, 
I try to follow, and I know social media helps a lot, these types of shows, podcasts, it helps to know like what is happening, what is the new, you know, latest things happening for the growth of our sport. So thank you guys so much for having me on. Thank you. That is the new Florida Vibe head coach, Leah O'Brien Amico. So amazing. She's got the the best energy. I'm like ready I know. To the vibe. I'm like, can I get out of retirement? Like who needs you, coffee? We got <laughs> Leah and O'Brien Amico. I mean, come on. Oh my gosh. I, I'm ready to go. I'm fired up. That's great. I've, I'm super excited. Uh, like I said, I, I've I've seen the vibe since the beginning. And so I'm excited to to see this continued growth and to to be able to watch the Chattanooga steam as well, uh, because I'll be up there and my TV partner, Kaylee Tao, is playing for the steam this summer, which she's really excited about. And we've been chatting about what that looks like. I, I really like the layout of this league. I've known Ryan for, a, I guess, shoot, almost five years now. And I, I think his vision is good. And I hope that the people uh, who need to get truly invested, get invested. And uh, side note, uh, if there are any broadcasters out there who want to call any of those games, hit me up in the DMs because I'm still looking for people for the summer leagues and probably some of the pro games. So let me know. I love that, Cray. Uh, and we'll get back into uh, college softball. But Fang, I, I see your message. Great Britain will be coming across to play the Spark. So uh, we will be playing the Spark in a two-game series, the Royal Spark Challenge. So Team GB will be a part of hopefully uh, just continuing the conversation and supporting professional softball. And I love that uh, Tina Floyd and the Spark have been really uh, supporting international softball as well. So hopefully we can then integrate and be a big part of that. But yes, uh, we are we are on it, Fang. We are on it for sure. Uh, Tara, let's talk about the RPI. Everybody's yep. favorite thing. Don't you love it? The RPI. I'm going to pull it up. You're shaking your head. Okay. Um, the number one team in the RPI is LSU. And now, to be fair, this is updated from the initial RPI rankings. We now have two whole RPI rankings. LSU, Georgia, Stanford, Texas, Missouri, your top five. Oklahoma, six. Clemson, seven. Alabama, eight. California, nine. Oklahoma State, ten. At, the committee has talked about utilizing a few other factors besides the RPI. I'm still of the mind that I kind of need to see them do that before I start visually shifting away from these metrics when they come out. But it is always interesting, Tara, to, to compare what the initial RPI looks like versus what the final seedings look like. And in the past, five of the top eight in the first RPI have hosted supers. So while sometimes that number changes and every year is different. We do have somewhat a blueprint about who the true contenders are this year for some of those big hosting spots that will be announced in about two months. And that is so interesting, Gray. And I love that you put that up on social, just taking a look at, we're starting at a certain point when you take a look at this RPI and we can't negate what LSU has done. Uh, in the first portion of the season. Now, I was actually, I watched some of the games in Clearwater. Uh, they are 19-0. That's still that's st still not an easy feat. You still have to win games. So the LSU Tigers uh, in that top spot, you, you'd argue that when we're taking a look at this RPI, and I don't know if we can put it up here for our listeners, but again, Gray did uh, – rattle them off but lsu georgia stanford texas missouri are the top five there so gray out of those top five do you think all of those will host uh a supers all host a super no uh, i think one of them probably missouri with apologies to my pal larissa anderson probably missouri is the team that drops out i i think i think gut reaction that's my take. I will say when you're number one in the initial RPI, again, people are like, oh, it's the first one. Things change. You're basically already a lock to host a super. Like it's very hard to, to drop out of the hosting a super conversation. A couple of years ago, the first team in the RPI, the first RPI was Virginia Tech. And they were the three seed, I believe. Uh, last year, um, it was, I think it was Oklahoma which we all know how that went. 
So like when you're the number one in the first RPI, especially when you play in a conference as tough as the SEC, it's going to be real tough for you to drop out of that top eight altogether. So I would say if there's one team I think will fall, it's probably Missouri. And if I'm LSU, I'm not like coasting to the end, but I feel extremely confident that I will be at home two weekends in the postseason this year. And what also is interesting to me, Gray, is when you take a look at this RPI, Louisiana is at 13 with a 10 and 12 record. They're at 13 with a 10 and 12 record. Yes. That- I will uh, I will quote my podcast partner, Tom Canterbury. If the tournament started today, Louisiana would be ineligible because they are under 500. But if they had won one game instead of lost it, they would probably be hosting a regional. That's how crazy it is. So uh, when you take a look at the RPI, you take, that's that's something that stands out to me. But this portion of uh, this 10 through 20 is really interesting to me. You've got Virginia Tech at, at 10, Oklahoma State at 11, Arizona at 12, Louisiana at 13, then Boston U, Arkansas, Auburn, Penn State, Texas State, Charlotte, Tennessee. So in, in that mix, when you're taking a look, we talked about Texas State on our spaces last night. When you take a look at the Charlotte team who beat Florida State on opening weekend, and we all are thinking, oh, my gosh, we're going to see the Charlotte team continue to roll. Uh, and then some lackluster performances since then. So I, I'm i always cognizant of, of that kind of section because, Gray, I see that moving a lot as we get into conference play. Tennessee feels like a prime candidate to be one outside the initial top 16 that jumps in to the conversation. Uh, I'm curious to see what Texas State and Charlotte and Boston U and all those mid-majors in the top 20, fringe top 20, do. Are those uh, are, are they actual legitimate contenders to host, or are they just great chances for teams like Oklahoma State and Oklahoma and Texas and all those squads that played them in the regular season, are they just great chances for high quality wins that can propel you forward? You know, Baylor is going to play a lot of those teams this year. Last year, they missed the cut barely, I think wrongfully, from hosting a regional. So I'm curious to see uh, what actually comes of all the mid-majors that we're seeing in that top 20. And we're about a month away from when I'll start doing legitimate bracket math but the way the resumes are already shaping up and the way the strength of schedule metrics are already shaping up was a little surprising to me but very very intriguing and those rained out games those uh canceled games rescheduled games are gonna have a a big impact we also think about florida state not traveling out to oregon uh to the pacific northwest this past weekend uh when you we take a look at that It's tough. And I was watching a conversation a little bit earlier about scheduling games. And yes, teams and coaching staffs uh, and head coaches do schedule two or three years out. So just a a reminder to to everybody. I mean, yes, you can pick a game up here and there, but these these schedules are made well in advance uh, due to budgeting purposes to make sure that um, the schedule is set. So there's a lot at play here. And I think this year, again, uh, every year we see what happens when the selection committee gets together, but they're still going to use the RPI. And even though other metrics are, are trying to uh, enter that phase at the NCA selection committee. And if you have a thought on the RPI, please let us know. Fang. Hello. Agree with gray yesterday. Oregon is really in trouble right now. So it was, We can talk about some of the lower teams on the RPI as well. Stunning to me that I wake up right now and I see Oregon at 81. Just unexpected. Like teams that are above Oregon right now on the RPI include Coastal Carolina, Marist, Western Kentucky, Marshall, Gardner-Webb, Purdue, Iowa. I, I did not expect that. And when you start that low, it's not impossible that you can, you know, climb your way back in. But I almost don't see a world where Oregon's in the NCAA tournament without winning the Pac-12. It's going to be tough, Gray. And we talked about it yesterday, and it's something to keep an eye on through season. But, yeah, once you start digging that hole, it's really hard to get out of it. But 
obviously, again, it is the first RPI of the season. We'll see how that all shakes out, but it's not looking very good for the Ducks right now. Is there anything else RPI-wise that you want to touch on before we ask a couple questions? Uh, I think we're pretty good, unless any of our uh, viewers have any questions in regards to the RPI. We'll go through this. I think uh, every time we have Good Morning Softball America, I think it's a good thing to pick apart and, and really talk about the RPI. But uh, you'd argue that LSU in that top spot, I think Beth Serena does a nice job with her scheduling and her team has also performed very, very well. So the LSU Tigers are in the driver's seat, and that's by no mistake, everybody. Uh, every year, Beth Serena uh, is able to put a schedule together to put her Tigers uh, in the best position possible. She does an excellent job of getting the teams that you, people might say, oh, really? They're playing them? Well, guess what? They're top 50 in the RPI. So it might not be a name to the outside world, but it's something that will help the resume. And there are coaches. I think Patrick Murphy does a great job of that, too. Honestly, uh, I've seen Mike White do that well at Texas. Like the experienced coaches, they are able to do that in a way that really helps what the profile will look like. And Veterina might be one of the best at crafting a schedule that helps the profile. I couldn't agree more, Gray. But if anybody has any questions about RPI, you can also send them to us as well. And Gray and I will get back to you. But we'd like to do this every week if you all enjoy it. So a couple things we need to get to before we talk about what's due up. Our players of the month, are out on Softball America as voted by the podcast network. And good to know that most of my picks won. So <laughs> I'm I'm not insane with some of my suggestions. Our player of the month for February, Tara, is Reese Atwood from Texas. It was like, I put that in the chat. You know, Brady said, send in your nominations. I said, I hereby nominate Reese Atwood from Texas. And I got three likes and that was it. Like it was the obvious selection. Reese Atwood, when you take a look at her numbers, and I just was going to grab them just again for uh, the month, her stat line, 527 batting average, uh, 1,700 OPS, 1,720 OPS. She's got six doubles, 10 home runs, and 37 RBI. Great. Just saying it out loud? Get out of town. Like, that is absolutely incredible. And someone asked a question yesterday on Spaces, what's dominant? That's pretty dominant to me. Uh, somebody that can can literally deliver for her team day in and day out uh, in some very clutch moments. I mean, we had her on the podcast because I just wanted to know what makes Reese Atwood tick. And her ability to put those numbers up in the first month of the season is just – when you would argue a sophomore slump would be uh, in store for somebody like that. And she's like, nah, I'm not all about that. I'm going, I'm just going to do better than I did my rookie season. She's also on that list, which is people, human beings who have hit a home run off Nigeria Kennedy in her collegiate career. There are four of them. Reese Atwood is one. This is a, a trivia question out to the chat. If you can name the other three, we'll send you something. If you can name the other three beyond Reese Atwood, we'll send you something. Is that cool, Tara? Is it okay if I make that decision? Yes. Okay. If you can name the other three humans in the next four minutes who fit a collegiate home run off of Nyjah Kennedy, we will send you something. In the next four minutes. Gosh. You, they're like, oh. We got it. <laughs> Who's surprised? It's Fang Nai. Oh, I thought that was can, hard. Send us your address, Fang. We'll 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 get you something. I get you a shirt or a mug or whatever you want, Fang. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, like a show, like whatever you want. We'll send it to you. Yeah, the answer is Kelly Lynch, twenty twenty three. Carissa Hamilton from Kentucky, opening weekend. Reese Atwood, and then Lindy Ray Davis from Georgia. This past time out. Nice. Fantastic. Nice. Our pitcher of the month, by the way, is Nigeria Kennedy. And there were a couple contenders here. I considered Maddie Pinta. Mm -hmm. I, I actually voted for Emily Kennedy, but it's hard to, to deny Nigeria Kennedy has not had necessarily the defense behind her the whole time. If you look at the stats, she's only given up 
five earned runs and seven unearned runs this year. There have been some miscues behind her, but she herself is as dominant as any pitcher that we've seen this early in her career. 102 punch outs, Gray. 102. How good. many innings pitched or how many innings pitched is that out of? I, I mean, you're, you're sitting there going, she is what you we call a generational talent. Like she is that. Like she is her. Nija Kennedy, she is her. And for her to again excel in the circle in her sophomore campaign when people have data on her, when they, they know what's coming. It's just been impressive to watch her. And Brady Vernon, our own very, very incredible Brady Vernon, has a story. Yes, we love Brady. Has a story up on the site. Oh, wow. That was amazing. Has a story up on the site on Nigel Kennedy and Tori Nyberger, the pitching coach at Stanford, and how closely they work with one another. And I love their quote, your best or our, my best, your best is, my best is your best. My best is your best. What is the quote, Gray? Uh, your best can be better. <laughs> something along those lines. No, I'm going to get it. I messed this up. I got it. It's in it. the headline. I'm going to pull it up. <laughs> your best is better. Your best is better. Yes. Like, yes. How great is that? Uh, so yes, Nigel Kennedy, pitcher of the month. Thanks. Yeah. Freshman player of the month is my girl, Jay Beecham from Florida State. She is the leader offensively for the Knowles, which while I thought she was going to have a great year, even I was surprised at how she has truly been the focal point of the offense. Started off the year, bottom half of the order. She's been moving up each and every week. It's an FSU team that has had some issues, as we've discussed, particularly with pitching, but the offense is still electric, and it's the freshman who's kind of setting the tone. I mean, between Beecham and Ross on the left side, I, I was able to sit behind the dish and, and watch Florida State. But Beecham, Jasoni Beecham plays like a seasoned veteran. She does not look like a freshman. She has this poise about her. And it is no surprise to me that she was our freshman uh, of the month. Just with the the numbers that she's been able to put up, I, I – I just have been increasingly impressed with her and uh, one of the top third basemen in the country. Not only is she our freshman of the month, but one of the top uh, 10 third basemen in the country. But stat line, 5'11", batting average, 1397 OPS, three doubles, four bombs, and 16 RBIs. It's freshman rookie campaign to do that for Florida State team and a team that We've talked about it. it has simply underperformed to still be able to do that uh, has has been incredible to watch. And her rival or Florida State's rival, Florida, uh, that is the uh, the team that claims the freshman pitcher of the month. And we can kind of use that to transition into what's due up this weekend because I have begun boarding for Alabama, Florida this weekend. Kaylee Town and I will be on the Saturday broadcast on SEC Network Plus. We're very excited, especially to get a look at Keegan Rothrock, who is as dynamic a freshman pitcher as we have seen uh, in, in a few years. And she does, I, I mean, she's given up five hits in the last 25 innings pitched. Th that's it. She's got 74 strikeouts in 62 innings pitch and a .67 ERA, Gray, I, I, as a freshman. And you know, had been hurt in, in tra travel and club ball, taking some time off, but for her to come in and step in and, and be a, an ace for Florida, I am so excited for the Alabama Florida series this upcoming weekend, because I think that one's going to be really set the tone for, for one team or the other uh, heading into SEC play. We talk all the time about the Florida offense against power five teams. Here's Keegan Rothrock against power five teams. 25 innings pitched, five hits, five runs, three earned. Those all came on one swing in the Oklahoma State game. Seven walks and 19 strikeouts. It's incredible. That is incredible. And the reason why she's our freshman pitcher of the month here at Softball America. So what's due up Alabama, Florida this weekend? We hope that you will tune in on Saturday. 
Tao and I. Very excited for that broadcast. Also, we got LSU at Kentucky. Kentucky needs to right the ship. What better way to do so than to try and take down the last unbeaten team in college softball? Texas at Houston. Virginia at North Carolina is one that not a lot of people are talking about, but Virginia has got a great pitcher in Eden Bigham. And North Carolina leads America in multiple offensive stats. I mean, how about the Tar Heels? I, I Again, that is such a, a change from just a season ago. When you take a look at those averages, take a look at uh, what they've been able to do. I, I think I spoke about this. I don't know if it was on here, but in Clearwater, uh, the Tar Heels knew they weren't going to actually get a game in. And instead of just staying at the hotel, they got in hitting in for an hour and a half. So a team that has been able to just make a big turnaround uh, and Megan Lyon Smith and, and what she's been able to do there. I, I, I think it's, it's going to be uh, interesting to see how they do in the ACC. And Virginia, don't forget about Virginia hanging around. They've got a great RPI to start things off. And I talked about Eden Bigham. That offense has some people as well. So keep an eye on the who's that's a, a squad worth watching. Oklahoma state at Baylor, huge series, Auburn at Missouri, Cal at Oregon, Oregon, if you want to turn it around, now's the time. A home series against the Bears, South Carolina at Texas A&M, and then Utah at UCLA, Tara. If Oregon didn't exist, we might be having the same what happened conversation about the Utah Utes who have just not gotten off to the start that I think we all expected this year. Uh, I agree, Gray. I I think we saw the Utes um, make that huge run to the women's college world series and just a really a lackluster performance uh, heading into conference pay, but you never know. I think this is where there's a turning point for both of those squads. It, it, it could happen in the last year of the pack, but you know, what's special to me about this weekend is uh, Utah will be coming to UCLA and UCLA is honoring the 1984 national championship team and the 2004 National Championship team at Easton Stadium this year. So on Sunday, I'll, I'll be with my former teammates, and that to me is something that's really, really special. And and uh, two decades ago, uh, we're we're all coming, we're all coming together two decades later uh, to celebrate uh, that team. I was going to ask. So where in the world is Tara Henry? She'll be at Easton Stadium. I'll be at Easton Stadium for sure on Sunday for uh, that Utah series. Uh, the other two days, we'll let you know on Twitter. Okay. (laughs) All right. Before we wrap up, Tara, and it's been a great episode of Good Morning Softball America, our February review show. What's on the site? What what's going on? What's on SA? Softballamerica.com. Well, well, it's funny that we're actually we're gonna have another surprise guest jump on here. I'm just gonna text and see if she's still gonna jump on because we've got another exciting partnership that we are going to announce on the site, and it's gonna be a part of our Uh, futures tab because as you all know we will have a large focus this summer on travel and club ball and so I just want to see if she's jumping on if not we'll just announce it Gray and I will just do two big announcements today okay Uh, you know me I love to proclaim things (laughs) yeah so we coach Amika Leah Amika she'll be heading up the vibe and we're just going to do this. We'll see if she's going to jump on, but us, uh, let's go here. We are announcing the Alliance and Softball America will be uh, partnering for the summer. We're going to be their media partner. And hopefully, we can get uh, Jamie Lopri's on here to talk a little bit about the Alliance and what that partnership looks like, but super excited to just expand our coverage on softball America. And I know Jen McIntyre and myself, uh, that was a mission of ours when we uh, talked about forming uh, the new softball America. And so can't wait to bring you coverage uh, regarding the Alliance fast pitch. We'll have a broader coverage of all athletes uh, in travel ball and club, but that is our big announcement. We're, we're teaming up with the Alliance. Very exciting. I, I've gotten to know Jamie a little bit. I called the Alliance All-Star Game last year in the Home Run Derby, uh, which was that thanks to Louisville, by the way, Louisville Athletics. That's a whole nother story for letting me even be able to call that All-Star Game. But I called a couple others and getting to know Jamie and watching some of these kids. You know, I, I've got a board in there 
in my guest room from that all-star game that I am now using to write about the freshmen that I am seeing across the country. Reagan Shockey, who I saw this past weekend in Tuscaloosa, she's got a square on that board too. And so I was able to use some of the facts and talk about her walk-up song, uh, which was a song I'm not familiar with, but we discussed it. (laughs) And what song was that? <laughs> I, I don't know. There are so many songs. I read it exactly how you think someone who didn't know the song would read it. And oh, our special guest is here, Tara. Whoa. Hello. Hey, on? We, you're on. Oh, you're on. Well, you're this live. is a big deal. <laughs> We just announced the partnership because uh, we didn't know if we were jumping on. So we just go ahead and announce it. But Surprise. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the Softball America. Well, this is actually Good Morning uh, Softball America podcast. Uh, so, Jamie, welcome. Uh, and just so excited about this partnership and what we're going to be able to bring for not only the sport of softball, but for future athletes uh, heading into college ball. Yeah, I, I'm really excited, um, not only to, to work with you guys, but I actually, I saw the post today about your 2025. So I went through and I was documenting all of the Alliance athletes that we have. Um, and even the top two were in our national championship game. Gray, you probably know them very well from uh, from that game too with Kai Miner and, and Lexi McDaniel. But yeah, really excited, appreciate what you guys do and, and bring to the sport and excited to bring that down to the youth level with uh, with the Alliance. So what is this going to look like? What, what, how will this all work as we get into the off season and start to learn more about these upcoming collegiate athletes? Tara, do you want to take that one? You want me to take that? <laughs> <laughs> I can take it. Well, it's really cool because uh, we're going to be able to feature some of the Alliance leaderboards on our website. So what, what I love most about this partnership is we'll be able to highlight uh, more performances uh, throughout leagues across the country and be able to have some stories about these various athletes, player spotlights that will be on the site. And, and we'll have some of these athletes jump on podcasts and, and have hopefully a show uh, alongside some of these uh, coaches and players. But just, again, collaboration is key here, and Jamie and I both believe in that. And I think when this came about, we knew that this was important, not only for both organizations, but for the sport of softball uh, and to work together. And, and Jamie, you can add anything I forgot uh, because uh, we've been we've been chatting for a while about this. Yeah, I think that was the exact conversation is honestly, I love what you guys are doing for the sport of softball at the professional level, college level. And there's so many stories inside of travel ball. Tara, you know this, right? I think you grew up a bat buster and I played for Impact Gold. It's such a huge part of our identity, essentially, as a softball player is your travel ball history, your travel ball career. And so for the last four years with the Alliance Fast Pitch, that's what we've been trying to build is that collective history of your travel ball career. And then also we pride ourselves in preparing those kids to through um, through the competition with our national championship, preparing them. It's very similar to NCAA postseason, um, putting them, we do press conferences at our national championships. I have some of the cutest 10U and 12U comments from, uh, from some of our players, but those are real life things, right? That they're going to do because a, a lot of the girls inside the Alliance, they do aspire to play at the next level and whatever that looks like for them. And so whatever we can do, to prepare them. And I think media is a huge part. There's some great storylines, kids that have overcome adversity, you know, all kinds of different storylines at at the youth level. And now you get to watch them all the way through their Alliance career. Now, based on where sports at, you can watch them on TV and kind of get to feel like, you know, that know that kid a little bit better. I do it now when I'm watching, I'll, I'll text Amanda Scarborough or some of the other broadcasters. I'm like, she was an Alliance all-star or I know like her story here. So we kind of, we get to see them first uh, before they become college stars. Yeah. I was just saying right before you popped on, I use my Reagan Shockey square from the all-star game in preparation for Alabama, Arizona this past weekend on the SEC network plus broadcast. And I had some fun facts that I would not have had otherwise <laughs> that I could throw on the square. I was thinking about that, Gray. I was watching the game, and you mentioned the the freshman Reagan Shockey, and I was like, I bet you remember her from the All Star game. So it it's cool. See, we're even even helping you guys out to have some some notes in their freshman year. Well, we are so excited for this partnership, and can't wait to get it going. 
We will have some updates on the site uh, as we start to merge uh, some of these leaderboards to have them available. Woohoo! So that. fancy. Look at that. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for, for jumping on the pod. Uh, anything else we can add? Gray, you got anything? I, I'm just excited. It's another thing to be excited about. What a day. I mean, this is Good Morning Softball America, and our two special announcements are about the pro side and something happened on the travel ball level. I mean, like everything is going on right now. And even though we're in season, the headlines all across the sport never stop. This is this was thrilling. Thank you so much for joining us, Jamie. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate what you do for the sport and now for the Alliance. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good to see you. Good to see you guys. Incredible. Crushed it. Oh, what a day. This has been so cool. Like you said, Gray, uh, youth all the way up to pro. Uh, and gosh, I couldn't be happier for for Coach Amico and uh, what she's been able to do uh, thus far in her career. And now she'll be leading uh, a pro team in the in the, the Florida vibe. And then the partnership with an alliance, it's just, just broadening our coverage and, and couldn't be happier. What a time and what a morning. Thank you everybody for waking up with us. You know, if you woke up when the show started, then, you know, I maybe, maybe set an earlier alarm, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining us here on good morning, softball America, Tara, any final comments before we press the close video and shut this down? No, we'll, we'll get back on here to talk more shop and softball next week. Uh, at some point we'll let you know. Uh, but we just, we had some big announcements and wanted to make sure that you guys could, could all um, experience them, but just thank you again for your loyalty. Thank you for being a part of our softball America family. And again, if we can offer more coverage or anything that you'd like to see, not only on the podcast, but on the site, please uh, don't hesitate to contact us. And, and if you like this, if you're on YouTube right now, please like the page and, and make sure that, um, you support not only uh, us, but our, our incredible network of podcast uh, hosts, because gosh, they are, they are special and are providing incredible content uh, week in and week out. Thanks, pal. I agree. And we have a great show coming up tonight in softball speakeasy, Walton's world tomorrow, Sydney spin tomorrow, final swing on Friday. And then we do it all again, except on Monday, there will be no episode of it just means more softball this week. And you know who's producing all of this? This guy, Gray cool. Robertson. So uh, not only is he hosts them, not only is he producing them, he is the heartbeat behind our uh, network. And Gray, appreciate you. Can't thank you enough for all your hard work, not only for Softball America, uh, but for the sport of softball. Uh, we are uh, better because of you. Oh, thank you, my friend. I, You're the best. You're the best. And we're grateful for you too, Tara, for everything that you've done for Softball America. And I am for me personally. But <laughs> we could wax poetic about how amazing Tara is and how I'm just like, okay, later on. I think it's time to wrap up. Good morning, Softball America. Thank you to our guests for joining us. Leah O'Brien and Miko, Jamie Lopriz for all of our amazing announcements. For my partner, Tara Henry, I'm Gray Robertson. We'll see you next time, everybody. Have a good afternoon.